Okay. That was Johan Looper, uh, version 2, which I'm going to be releasing along with this video. My original plan uh, was to use it as a prop um, while I talked about this subject, which is adding MIDI clock to a patch that doesn't have it. Um, this is my third time trying to shoot this video, and I found that doing the little play acting thing where I added MIDI clock along with the rest of you just didn't work out. Uh, it led to some long, not particularly focused videos, so I'm going to try and make things a little bit more concise uh, by not doing a sort of uh, pretend thing. Um, so the f the first thing I'm going to talk about with adding MIDI clock uh, to a patch that doesn't have it is there's a, a checklist you should probably go through in some way, shape, or form. You might not write it out as three questions that you ask yourself, but there are things that you want to think about um, before you endeavor to, to perform this. The first one is what do we know about the patch to begin with? Um, what I mean by that is, do you know if it has tap tempo? Do you know if it has something that is controlled by a rate control? Uh, do you know if it has uh, things that, that you know, are, are often subjected to tap tempo, like delay modules? Um, thinking about what we know about a, a patch before we try to add MIDI clock or anything to it, uh, can give us a, a better sense of how to proceed. <coughs> Sorry, I'm still recovering from a cold, so there will be some coughs and my voice is low. Um, so, you know, before you, you begin modifying any patch, but particularly with MIDI clock, if it has tap tempo, then we're probably going to be looking for a stomp switch uh, as a source of clock that we can use to add MIDI clock. Um, if it has a rate control, then we may be looking for a value module or an LFO that the value module is controlling. Um, the, the, that's the rate that it's adjusting. Um, <coughs> so first you want to think about what you know about a patch before you begin down this path of adding MIDI clock to it. And that goes into number two, which I talked about already. I'm rambling and off topic, but these two are related. As we think about what we know, um, think about what that means. You know, like I said, if it has tap tempo, like this patch did before I added MIDI clock to it, and this patch still does, then you know that somewhere there's gonna be a stomp switch module that connects to something related to clock. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, the, the relationship between these two is important. The third is sort of a caveat, which is that, um, while there are modules that may be timed, one of the difficulties about, a, uh, uh, adding MIDI clock or tap tempo um, if a patch may not have tap tempo to, to certain things that have regularity is that there are certain modules that are not subject uh, to tap tempo. So for instance, uh, one that often comes up is a slew limiter. Um, slew limiters are used a lot of times to control the rate of change for something. So if, if you have something that you want to, um, you know, uh, a good example would be to, to add uh, would be to add sort of a curve to the output of a random module. A random module will go up, down, you know, it'll right, um, but it does all of those at plateaus. It's all you know steppy, uh, and a slew limiter might be a way of smoothing those steps somewhat so that it glides between those two uh, positions. Um, and slew limiters aren't subject to tap tempo. If you change the tap tempo, 
uh, you change the relationship between the, the values and the slew limiter won't work the same way. It won't scale as you expect. So uh, what might be a good slew limit value uh, for, for one tempo is not for another tempo. Um, so anyhow, the, there are some caveats to, to reconsider. Uh, you know, as you start thinking about a patch, if it has a bunch of stuff that, that sort of happens randomly, um, that may be part of what makes the patch do what the patch does. So there, there are reasons to reconsider. Not every patch is destined for tap tempo or MIDI clock, um, at least while preserving characteristics that you may value in it. So that's step one. Fancy edit. <clears throat> and I should address the elephant in the room. I have this new whiteboard. I know what you're thinking if you've seen my other videos. I mean, what sort of production values are you up to, Christopher? This is going to blow the competition out of the water. Who else uses a whiteboard except for Bo Beats, who I got the idea from? Um, <coughs> he uses a white table. Uh, I didn't have money for a white table, but I will say that my patrons on Patreon paid for this, so thank you. Um, if you would like to help me buy more fancy whiteboards, uh, please consider supporting me on Patreon. I'm told I don't plug that well enough. So <clears throat> we've talked about what you want to think about before you begin adding MIDI clock to a patch, um, or th these processes might work for tap tempo too if a clock, if a patch doesn't have tap tempo. Um, when you start that process, uh, there are <clears throat> two different approaches that you can take. Um, so we talked about, you know, if, if a patch has tap tempo, you're looking for a stomp switch. If it has a rate control or an LFO that you know controls the clock, you're, you're looking for um, those modules. And one way to, to look for them is to use the DSP usage uh, function, which you can find in the configuration menu, which is shift in these little gears down here. And if you scroll down, it's right above factory reset. We don't want to confuse those two. And if you press it, what it's going to do is give you some overview of what's in a patch, what's using certain amounts of CPU, uh, and you can go through and as you select different modules, Here's a bunch of pixels. Each one will be lighted up. So if you're looking for a specific type of module, if you're looking for a pixel, you're in luck. Uh, if you're looking for a certain type of module, you can use the DSP usage uh, to search through a patch for those modules. Um, so here is the stomp switch that, that used to control the tap tempo for Johan Looper. It's now paired with a MIDI clock. And for those of you who are interested in using one or the other at home, there's a switch on the second page of the patch to select between the two. Um, let me get back into DSP usage. When you select a module, it takes you out of DSP usage. So. This is one way to search through a patch, particularly if you're looking for a certain type of module. Um, another module you might want to look for is clock dividers. You can trace clock dividers back to some clock source. Um, you know, whether that's, again, a, a stomp switch that is providing tap tempo or an LFO or, or uh, those are the big ones. Um, possibly a comparator. Um, But the, there is a limitation to DSP usage, which I'm about to show you, which is we've reached the 
61st uh, thing that's outputted on DSP usage, and we can already see on this page that it's not the last module. This is the last thing that, that DSP usage showed us. And right below it, we have another module. And in fact, we have a stomp switch, uh, which if we're looking for a stomp switch and it's not that first one we encountered, um, then DSP usage may not give us a good sense of, of where to find that. But the advantage of DSP usage is you can scroll through looking for specific modules you can get an overview of what modules are in a patch. Um, and, you know, if, you're, if you know that there are a number of stomp switches, uh, you can sort of form a, a visual memory of where they are in the patch. So it's easier to remember that you're looking for a little red square in the bottom corner uh, than it is to start hitting every single module, trying to figure out if that's the one that you're looking for. Um, but again, this patch goes on, there are a couple more pages, uh, and DSP usage only shows so much. Um, get it off that distracting screen. So DSP usage can fail us uh, in this quest. It is still a valuable tool, particularly diagnostically if something's going wrong in a patch. Uh, a, one thing to check is if a module is, is using way more CPU than you would expect, which DSP usage can tell you. So sometimes you just have to start digging around in a patch and you're looking for specific things. I'm going to come back to stomp switches, but you know, if something's timed, uh, there are probably LFOs or sequencers. And the more you work with Zoya, the more these things sort of pop out at you as you scroll through a patch. Loopers always have these configuration of, of lights. They're really easy to identify in, in patches. Uh, larger modules tend to be uh, things like uh, effects blocks. Um, and if you see a bunch of flashing lights like this, particularly at the outputs, you're looking at LFOs. If you see something like this, where you've got one flashing light and then another light moving across things, uh, you're probably looking at a sequencer or something like this switch, which is connected to a sequencer. Um, here's another LFO. So the more you see these things, uh, the more apparent they become. And, and the last thing that I'll point out is that a lot of interface modules, like a stomp switch, like MIDI clock, um, like uh, the C port, like you can go on, look like this. They're just a little single block of a single color. Um, and if they aren't receiving stomp, for instance, this will light up when I press it, uh, then they're pretty much inert. They, you know, they're either lighting up in response to something that you know is happening. You know, if you're adjusting the, if you're using a C port to control an expression pedal, you know when you're moving the expression pedal. So you can see that. Um, if you're using uh, the stomp switch to, to, to put in tap tempo, you, you know when you're doing that. So uh, if you see these little single blocks, um, you know, particularly if they're hidden in a patch, sometimes they can be pixels or UI buttons, but most of the time if you're using a pixel or a UI button, you're not going to put it on the fourth page of a patch. So that's something else to look for. When you find stomp switches in particular, there's a pretty easy cheat to tell if it's the one that you're looking for. We know that tap tempo comes in uh, from the left stomp switch. So we can look at it, press the stomp switch and see that. We can also just open up the options and if it says stomp switch left, our search is over. Um, so once you find where the clock is coming from, whether it's tap tempo, an LFO, um, you know, a value module that is controlling an LFO, if it's something like a, a rate control, um, then 
the, the process is to sort of trace where that goes. So here we have the stomp switch. Let's, let's imagine I didn't add the MIDI clock. We have the stomp switch and it goes out here into a clock divider um, that I never use, but I put in there thinking I might. You might use it. Uh, and then we can start looking at where the clock divider goes. So it goes to all those LFOs and another LFO and that LFO goes to the sequencer. Shocking. Um, but we can get a sense of where that clock uh, arises from. The other way we can do that is by working backward. Um, we can do this in one of two ways. We can either start looking, we can press down on something like an LFO and start looking to see what else lights up in a patch. Um, or we can use the view option, which is shift in this I. The first thing it'll show us is some CV values. And then it'll show us the connection list. So here we can see, sometimes this is another familiarity thing, but you can start to decode these little symbols that are used to identify connections. So clock, divider, uh, CV out is where this input connects to. Um, and so, you know, once you start figuring out where your clock comes from or working backward, uh, the next thing to do is I like to, to mirror everything. So what I did was I created this switch. Um, the MIDI clock goes into the second channel. The tap tempo goes into the first. I like the option. Um, and then I replicated the signal path uh, before I broke any connections. And one thing to keep in mind as you're doing this um, is that if you're practicing best practices in patching, um, you, you might want to abstain from saving as much as I might otherwise advise. Because if something goes wrong, um, it's really easy to, to just go back to an earlier version before you started messing around with the clock. So this might be an instance in which you resist the urge to save, 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 save. Although, you know, worst case scenario, you probably have a, an older saved version of the, the patch on the SD card or, or something like that. Um, but, you know, before you begin any sort of major overhaul, and this is a kind of major overhaul of a patch, make sure you have a, a backup. Um, because you, you might not like what you find. You could copy the patch too. There, there are a bunch of different options there. Uh, you might realize that it's one of those patches you should reconsider and you don't want to be in a, a situation where you've pulled out all the guts and, and don't want to put it back together or not quite sure how to put it back together. Um, and, you know, there's no magic method to this. There's no, you know secret word that you can whisper, but, but these are the ways in which you would go about adding MIDI clock or tap tempo if a, a, if a patch doesn't have that to that patch. Uh, and really, you know, there are ways that you can go about looking at how any patch is constructed and thinking about how to add other things to it. Um, so just in, in general, DSP usage is a good way to get an overview of, of a patch, but it's limited because it only shows so many modules. Um, you know, if a jerk doesn't fill up their front page with pixels, that might not be such an issue. A lot of my patches tend to exceed the limits of, of DSP usage, uh, but not all patches. Uh, and then, you know, the other thing is, if that doesn't work, you can start looking for specific things. You know, flashing lights tell you that something is being timed. Um, little inert modules like this are places where you might go, all oh, right, what happens? When, oh, you know, the stomp switch affects that. Um, you know, and that's easier than just going through and pressing every single module and, and trying to figure out what does what. Um, so this still ended up being pretty long and rambly. 
uh, but I think it's a little bit more focused than my previous attempts. Uh, I'm going to stop talking now and drink more hot tea.